morning. We are glad, as always, that you're here. If you are visiting, we want you to know uh, at every opportunity that we're glad that you're here, and our prayer and hope is that uh, you will come back and visit with us again, and if not, that uh, you will go on to your travels safely and that you will find it extremely beneficial uh, to join in the worship service with us to the almighty, true, living God. And as always, if you're a member of the Lord's body, we're glad that you're here. We are very, very grateful and thankful for your presence. Sometimes I wish that uh, you wouldn't necessarily have to preach, but uh, if you could come up and see the view that I see and see God's love radiated through his people from all walks of life, from all ages, from all educational backgrounds, from different financial situations, from different health situations, it would strengthen you as much as it does. I am sure Roger, every time he stands up and every time that I stand up, and every time that anyone else stands up and takes a look at you. When you think about the beginning of the church, what do you think about? Did the church have a beginning? Was the church always there? Where would you go to find that? Is there a place where you can go and find that? beginning. This morning we want to take an overview look at the first couple chapters of the book of Acts. Our goal is uh, very simple. We want to uh, look at what Jesus asked them to do, look at what they did, look at what Peter preaches, and then the title of our lesson is, is now they, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. I think the King James Version says pricked in the heart. So when you think about that, what does that really mean to be cut in the heart, to be moved that much by something that you hear or something that you see or something that transpires around you? So that's our goal this morning. We're going to look at it from three perspectives. We're going to look at uh, just overview of the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus promised, John the Baptist promised as well, and the prophets prom promised. Uh, we're going to look at Peter actually preaching Christ. Uh, and then we're going to take a look at the end of their response. You know, we know a little bit about Peter and who he is and how he lived. And, you know, Peter is really, a, oftentimes we say that Peter is more like us than all the other leaders. I don't know if that's true or not. If you really look at Peter's life, uh, Peter covers some ground. Uh, he, he recognizes uh, through the Spirit of God that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He he, he, he denies him true three times, but then he comes back and delivers this unbelievable first gospel sermon to, if you will, open the doors of the church. Uh, uh, that's, that's Peter. Uh, Peter uh, also was fishing, as you might remember, and um, Jesus told him to fish on the other side, and they caught so much that uh, it broke the nets, and they had to get help from James and John, and Peter just declared, Lord, I'm, I'm a sinful man. Which, which happens when you're in the presence of Jesus. Whether you're reading it or whether you're in his presence physically, you immediately realize uh, your sinful nature, your inadequacies, uh, because why? It's Jesus the Christ. He's the son of the almighty, true living God. So we're going to look at that part, and then we're going to look a little bit as, as he preached, and then we're going to look at their response, and I think that their response uh, is, is a very good one for us to emulate. Um, if possible, if it moves you that way, if it doesn't move you that way, then it would not be good for you to emulate them on uh, untrue pretense. Jesus told them countless times, he tried to prepare them that he was going to be delivered into the hands of lawless men, of sinful men, and that he was going to be crucified, but he was going to be raised again on the third day. He said it in a myriad of ways talked about the temple, and they thought it was the physical temple, but he was talking about his body. He knew why he came, he knew what he was going to do, and he knew how much time he had to prepare them, which was no easy task, and yet he succeeded at it. And so he told them that when he goes away, that they were supposed to stay in Jerusalem and meet in an upper room, and that they would receive God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so here we have in Acts 5, I mean Acts chapter 1, here's what uh, Luke writes. 
And the first in this in the first book of Theophilus, talking about the gospel of Luke, he said, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's Jesus' background for them, and that's what they're supposed to wait for, and they actually end up doing that. When they're there, um, we look at it again. So they're standing there, and they're trying to figure it all out, and here's what it says. And so when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but he will, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and the end of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven, as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him going into heaven. As you know, um, they end up replacing Judas. Uh, they drew straws and they prayed about it. And Matthias, Matthias uh, end up be taking his place. Uh, that, that's recorded here. And it goes on to say that uh, another's office would be taken. But here's where I want to take it up uh, and listen to these words on the day of Pentecost. That's 50 days after the Passover seven Sabbaths and one day, and that's where they're meeting, and that was a holy day. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now where there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each one in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Ferga and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. God had promised that he was going to pour out his spirit on mankind in the last days. That's exactly what we have taking place here. What an unbelievable event has taken place. The promise that was made through Abraham is now being fulfilled in their very ears and their very eyes and their very hearts. So we listen and then here comes Peter. Peter always seems to stand up and say the right thing most of the time. Here's what Peter says. But standing, but Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. That's 9 a.m., but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heavens above and signs on the earth below. Fire, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before that day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. 
And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as ye yourselves know. This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for, possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And then Peter puts the exclamation point on it and says this. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certainty, for certain, that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. There's a lot going on here. Here's seven basic things that are happening on the day of Pentecost and the birth of the church. They're distinct. They take place right as we're reading the passage now. Number one is the beginning of the age of the Holy Spirit. Number two is the beginning of the public proclamation of Jesus as Christ. If you remember, Jesus said it countless times. His time had not come yet, so they weren't supposed to say anything. It's the beginning of the preaching of the gospel. It's the beginning of the offer of forgiveness in Jesus' name. It's the beginning of the new covenant. It's the beginning of the gathering of the church together. It's the beginning of the corporate worship in life. And those seven places were found in Everett Hutchins' book, The Church of Christ for Today. Christ preached. That's very similar to what we find in Romans. Listen to how Paul describes almost the same thing in the book of Romans in the first part. He says that Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, here we go, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. After Jesus fed the 5,000 and Peter confessed that he was the Christ, he told them as much the same thing. In Luke 9, Jesus tells them that this is going to take place. It also says that the Holy Spirit will bring to remembrance, and I'm sure that they remember Jesus saying some of these things when it came time. Now what happened that as he was praying alone, the disciples were with him, and he asked them, who do the crowd say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist. But others say Elijah and others that one of the prophets of the old is risen. Then he said to them, but whom do you say that I am? And Peter answered, the Christ of God. And then here's what he says. And he strictly charged and commanded them to tell this to no one, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed on the third day and be raised. When you stop and think about this sermon, 
and you look at the people that Peter is addressing, these are the exact same people that delivered Jesus over to Pilate in exchange for Barabbas. Remember, remember Pilate said, I'm, I find no fault in this man. And they still wanted to crucify him. These are the same people that witnessed the mighty works of God and denied them because of the day on which they were performed. They argued often. Why would you give a man sight on the Sabbath? Why would a man who couldn't walk be allowed to walk on the Sabbath? Why would a lady who had a blood issue be healed on the Sabbath? They go on and on and on and miss the very graces of the almighty, true, living God. They miss the very thing that Jesus came to do for them. How they missed it, I do not know, other than the scriptures say that God hardened some hearts, some he didn't. They have ears to hear, but they can't hear. They try to understand, but they can't grasp it. He tells it to them in parables, and some understand and some don't. We, having read the Gospels multiple times, if you're not careful, you start reading the Gospels going, my goodness gracious, they really don't get it until you put yourself in their shoes. When you put their, yourself in their shoes, trying to hear it for the first time, trying to understand what's really taking place, it's not the easiest thing in the world. And yet when you watch Jesus and what he does and how he treats people, you know it's something different. Why? Because no one else does the things that he does. Countless times we hear this. No man spake like this man. When we read it, we get it because we get to look at it and digest it and meditate on it and we understand they're the words of life. But for them to hear him speak in comparison to what the Pharisees and the scribes and the other religious leaders were saying, it must have been as different as night and day. So for one set who hears him speak, it activates faith. The exact same words for others activates animosity. Isn't that interesting about the gospel? It draws some and repels others, and yet it's the exact same gospel. And depending on where we are in our life, when that happens, we could be on either side of that. There was a time in my life when I repelled it. It wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't where I was going. It wasn't what I was trying to do. But over time through reading, through grandparents' prayers and other people, and my heart warming up, and then reading it for my own sake, all of a sudden it comes alive. Why does it come alive? It comes alive because it affects me. It comes alive because it affects you. As long as it's something distanced for somebody else, it's not that big of a deal. But when we come face to face with it for ourselves, that's a game changer. Regardless of what other people do or say, that's really, I believe, the heart of the gospel. How do we, or how are we able to preach? Obviously, God gets the glory, he takes his word, he sinks it in the heart. But our dilemma becomes, how do we share that story and literally hold up a mirror so that you can see yourself in the heart of Jesus? Because that's the difference in the gospel. That's the difference when you compare it to anything else that we know. If you look at any organization in the world, regardless of how wonderful it is or how wonderful it is not, it pales. We sing victory in Jesus. There isn't a person here that doesn't have some kind of sports team or a grandkid plan or, or something where we don't understand the joy of competition. You could almost say it's in the American bloodstream. Not necessarily a bad thing, not necessarily a good thing. It is what it is. It depends on what you do with it. But it pales in comparison to the victory 
that we have in Christ. Why? Because in Christ, watch this, we're living what? The game of life. If you want to call it a game, it's the game of life. We're reminded of that daily, aren't we? We're reminded of it tenderly. Sometimes we're reminded of it abruptly. But we're reminded of it daily. And then here becomes the challenge. Sometimes the more days we get, the more, if we're not careful, the more nonchalant we get, the more just going through the rut, if you will, we get if we don't realize and treasure each and every day. Why? Because each day is a gift. I know I say this all the time, but it's true. People say this, oh, Harry, we're getting old. And they mean different things when they say it, but all the guys my age usually mean something negative. We can't do what we used to do. No, we can't. We're not as fast as we used to be. No, we're not. We don't hit the ball like we used to. No, you don't. Things are aching that didn't ache at one time. Of course they're aching. And I don't mean to blow the bubble, but I say this every single time. The last I checked, getting another birthday was a good deal. Why? Because we treasure this. Our victory is in Christ. It's, it's, it's for who he is and how he lived that shows us how to live each day of our lives so that it becomes like everybody who prays and reads and teaches us today who all say the same thing. Let our example be what it ought to be like Christ and let our words be what they ought to be like Christ. Easier said than done, but yet that's what we all strive to do. Christ preached. Jesus foretold that they would have a hard time, but yet he did. The hearer's response. So we look at him, we said, these are the same people. Watch. So Peter preached to the very people that turned Jesus over. And so when Peter says that you guys crucified the Christ, we get that crystal clear, don't we? They did it. Pilate tried to excuse him. They wouldn't. They wanted Barabbas instead. And so we go, my goodness gracious, how could they have done that? We get how they would be pricked in the heart, don't we? They should have. They should have. But you know what? Although we weren't there, and although we didn't deny him and turn him over to Pilate, it was equally for our sins that Jesus the Christ died on the cross. Therein lies the essence and the heartbeat of the gospel. Whether you were there or whether you were born, we're all in the same boat. Why? We hear it all the time. Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I know we hear that. And I heard a student one time when I was uh, at the school. And he, bless his heart, he was sincere. And I, I, I understood exactly what he was saying. But he came up to me one time, he was frustrated. And he said, you know what, if one more person tells me that God loves me, I'm going to hit him in the nose. He was just getting tired of hearing it. He understood it. He got it. He was just getting tired of hearing it. Well, there's some things in this world you can get tired of hearing. I'm not so sure that God's love is one of them uh, when it's a favorable thing in your life. When it's not a favorable thing in your life, it might be a little much. But I'm not so sure if it's not. So when we look at them, when Jesus' is healings, uh, when you think about, hey, what's, how about this? How about the, some of these people are the people who said that if you follow this Jesus, we're going to kick you out of the synagogue. Remember the blind man? They kept asking him, then they asked his parents, and they were fearful because the leaders were going to kick them out of the synagogue. They're going to kick them out of the organization to which Jesus' lineage came through. The Christ. That's who we're talking about here. In every way that you look at it, there's no way around it. It's kind of amazing. But here's what you got to love about it. Here's what you got to love about it. Acts chapter 2. Here's what you got to love. Peter says, as though to drive the point home right through the center of their hearts, 
Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God had made him both Lord and Christ and Jesus whom you crucified. It's the Pentecost. They're there from countries from all over the world, if you will. And Peter's preaching. And then here's what they said. So they obviously were listening. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? You got to give them credit for two things. Two things. Watch this. Number one, number one, they knew what to ask. And number two, they knew who to ask. Men and brethren, what shall we do? We're convicted. We remember the great works. We, we understand that Joel prophesied this. Peter's declaring it. We saw the Holy Spirit move through them. We heard them speak in our own language. Truly, this must be the Son of God. What are we going to do? What should we do? They're convicted. That's what the Word of God does. It convicts. Why? Because it's alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts going and coming. Separation of bone and marrow. The point is, is that it comes down into your very life and asks you to do something. It asks you to activate it by faith in the almighty, true, living God through his son, Jesus, or not to. But here's the great thing about God's love. You get to choose. Oh, he calls. He gives you every opportunity. People pray for you that you don't even know about. What else could he give? And yet, it's still left up to you. Does it get any better than that? Is there any more responsibility than that? Is there any greater joy and relief when you surrender? By faith to the almighty, true, living God that you can arise and walk in newness of life and be forgiven for your sins and be in a good standings with God from now until the end of your days if you serve him faithfully. They ask the right questions to the right persons for the right reasons. Longnecker, in his book on commentator, on the, on the book of Acts, says this. I, I, I just thought this was kind of bullseye. He says, Peter's preaching had been effective. The people were cut to the heart at the awful realization that in crucifying their long-awaited Messiah, they had rejected their only hope of salvation. So with deep anguish, they cried out, Brothers, what shall we do? Isn't that where we come to when we hear the gospel, when we obey it, regardless of our age? Even though we haven't crucified anybody, we still come to that place when we stand before Jesus and we go, what shall I do? And we say the same thing. Through faith, through repentance, through confession, that you can be born again by the almighty true living God. So when we look at this, their actions. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, please don't take this the wrong way, but I, 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 wanna, I wanna say something real gingerly here. I have friends like you do that I love and that I adore and who love me. I read tracks just like you do from time to time. I like you wrestle occasionally. Are we trying to say too much to people? And what about the people who are sincere? Do you think that if, I don't want to say this the wrong way, do you think that if the sinner's prayer was appropriate, Peter would say it here? Wouldn't this be the ideal place for it? Could there be a better audience? Men and brethren, what shall we do? Could, shouldn't Peter have said, just invite the Lord into your heart and be sincere? Shouldn't he have said that? That's not what he said. 
He's guided by the Holy Spirit. It's not about me and you. It's about what did Peter say? Listen to what he says. They're cut to the heart. They realize. They realize that they gave up the almighty, true, living God's son. And they gave him up to Gentiles. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brother, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was promised. It's already been given to the 12 on the day of Pentecost. Peter is preaching now and letting every born, watch this, letting every Christian who is born again, I don't know if there's such a thing as a born again Christian, you either one or the other, but we can double do it if we want. But every Christian will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why? Listen to this. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. How does he call us? He calls us through the gospel. He calls us through the good news of Jesus Christ. Whether you live in Africa, whether you live in Guyana, whether you live in Marietta, whether you live in Australia, he calls us through the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. That's a lot of baptizing if it's not that important. And they're from all over the world, and they go back and take the same message with them. I, like you, have one hope in this life, and it's Jesus Christ, my Lord. Outside of his word, I don't know what that means. Matter of fact, I am convinced that you don't either. It's God's word to us that we might know how to serve him. And by having faith in him through his word, then we naturally would want to obey him. I have no other fight in this thing. I'm just trying to serve my God as best I can, as I am sure you are, according to his word. So when we look at this, we saw the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus had promised, and it was an event. It was the crowning birth of the church, if you will. Why? Because Jesus came for one reason and one reason only, and that was to seek and to save the lost. No other reason. No other reason. We, we heard Peter stand up and preach what will be officially called the first gospel sermon and give people an opportunity to respond. And then with our own ears this morning, we heard how they responded to the gospel. By faith, they obeyed it. They received forgiveness of sins. They received the Holy Spirit. They formed a community. Now they become the church. And they praised God and had favor with God and with man. God poured out his spirit as he and the prophet said he would. Christ was preached as the son of God, the Messiah, the Christ, in whom is forgiveness of sins. When God's word falls on honest hearts, it moves people to obedience through faith, repentance, and obedience. To Christ preached, and we looked at their response. Won't you respond to our God and his Lord, our God and our Lord, through and by his word that you might be forgiven of your sins and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit? And then I want to close, if I could, with this verse. Although we didn't physically crucify Jesus, it was equally for our sins that he did die. We're going to sing in a few moments, there is power in the blood. The shedding of Jesus' blood is what it took for us to have forgiveness of sins. And when he had said these things and they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven.
The same Jesus that we read about, that went back to be with the Father and got the right hand, is coming back again. When he returns, will you be one of his sheep and recognize him calling you by name? Or unfortunately, will you be one of the ghosts and who has no idea what he just said? We're going to sing, There's Power in the Blood. If we can help you in any way, form, or fashion, please come forward.